Thank you very much. We have three panelists. May Yoke and Hanyi, of course, we've already met, but we're also very pleased to welcome um, Wu Hui Yao, uh, a senior consultant from Woodlands Health, and I understand a heavy weight of the palliative care community in Singapore. So he's very kindly stepped in to replace Professor Krishna, and they will be responding, taking questions, discussing these cases with us. I'll start by reading out the case study. You'll have that in front of you on your tables to follow as well. And the first case is a case involving a best interest decision around a neonate patient, a patient who's just been born. So this is the case. Mr. and Mrs. Kang are Chinese nationals. They both live and work in Singapore for a large hotel chain in housekeeping and property maintenance. They're both S-Pass holders in Singapore's immigration system, i.e. skilled workers who usually earn between three and $6,000 per month. Mrs. Kang had a healthy pregnancy and delivered a baby girl at 35 weeks. At one day old, the baby had a brain hemorrhage and the prognosis is uncertain for disability. The doctors believe the baby may survive, but will have some sort of neural disability. The baby is currently ventilated, but is expected to come off the ventilator in a few days. The parents have requested to withdraw the ventilator. They are worried about the financial costs of caring for a baby with disability and her long-term care needs because they're both working and earn a moderate income. When they return home to China, they live in a rural area where health and care facilities for a disabled baby are very limited. They also express concerns about what quality of life their baby could expect in the future. So the first question is the big question, I guess, for this case, the very question about the decision itself. Should the healthcare team withdraw the ventilator? And we have three options. Yes, no, or unsure. Great, so we have perhaps more unsure members of the audience than we've had in previous polls, um, but also a clear majority view. We should not be withdrawing the ventilator. And presumably that's, we should go against what the patients would prefer. Sorry, the parents should prefer. So this is now where you get the chance to um, do your ethical thinking. Let's start with the majority of you in the audience. Those of you who said no, the healthcare team should not withdraw the ventilator. I'm looking for a volunteer who will come up to the mic here, or indeed take one of the roaming mics and summarize very briefly their, their, their first thinking about this. Then I'll hand over to the panel for their views. Anybody like to express themselves? Sorry, I thought a few people put up their hands. Uh, so I put no because I think this is a perfectly survivable medical condition so from a medical practitioner point of view. And as a, as a consultant practitioner point of view, I think um, that the uh, healthcare team should not withdraw the ventilator. Great. So we have a sort of, in your view, a clear medical indication for what should happen, and that is in favour of continuing treatment. Thank you. Anybody like to build on that? Who also holds the same position? Perhaps say a bit, bit more, expand, offer a different reason in, in favour of withdrawing, sorry, not withdrawing the ventilator. Any other no's who want to add anything? Thank you. My name is Wika from Indonesia. So I think I would like to build on that uh, argument because I also answered no medically. Uh, I think it's uh, possible that the baby could survive even though um, I think variation A here wrote that uh, the prognosis is um, like the, the most severe would be like uh, lifelong care for all day activities or of daily living and severe disabilities intellectually and physically, but then uh, it's, the baby will, will be able to survive and live, even though uh, maybe quality of life could be subjective. If it's according to the baby, then we don't know that yet. So um, I think another assumption is because 
what the parents here in the case put out as a reason is more about um, the what ifs, and they're, they're projecting the uh, possible burden that they will have, and they don't have any vision about how to go about that burden. So I think that is uh, the place where others can come in, or maybe the society can help, and also the hospital or the government would be able to find a way to support. So I think the reason from the parents is not something that is um, a clear cut or like a dead end. So, so that's why it doesn't really give any justification to really um, grant the request of the patients. I mean, we can still have a lot more discussion with them about how to go about it. Lovely, thank you. Yes. So beyond the mere medical facts, broader quality of life, considerations pointing towards not withdrawing treatment, and the problem of the what if, this idea that the parents are imagining a life that might be incongruent with the facts. Good, thank you very much. Let's try the other side of the fence. There's 24% of you who said yes. How would you respond to those kinds of views or what drove your own judgment in this case? Anybody like to give the other side of the argument? Um, my name is Jocelyn, so I work in, as a GP. Um, I think I voted yes because one, I read from the vignette that it's expected to come off the ventilator. So the question is when, if it's let's say what the medical team deems would be reasonable trial of active to come off the ventilator anyway after a few days, I think it's reasonable. The other thing, taking into account the cost, practically I would be very stressed if I'm the parents. ICU cost in Singapore is not cheap for a foreigner. We have no help for foreigners here. So we're talking about a few thousand dollars a day. And that, you know, a, a few days, maybe we can negotiate with parents to say hold off till like the medical team actually recommends, maybe a few more days to see. But I would say if after the recommended days, when the patient is supposed to be on ventilator, um, I, I would feel very hard because so what if we push medically? I mean, who's going to pay the cost for this? extensive stay as well. So that would be my considerations. Wonderful, thank you. That's very helpful. So we have some views there about taking seriously the cost implications and how they might be managed. Thank you. Anybody else like to develop that, have something else they want to add? And then before I hand over to the panel for their response. Hi, Nita from uh, CBME. I actually looked at that line about the baby coming off the ventilator in the opposite way. So I voted no because what we would be doing is taking advantage of a little window where we can withdraw and the baby will die. Whereas in three days or five days' time, if we take the baby off the ventilator, we've got a good chance that the child will survive. Mm -hmm. And I think the cost issues are real, and I think the care issues are very real and very difficult. But taking advantage of that window is ethically problematic to me. If you, do it today, if you can do it today and you can't do it next week, you shouldn't do it. Okay. Yeah, I'm not so, articulating it very well. But thank right. you. Yeah, so the window and the kind of raw facts of basic survival as they present in this window seem important to you. We think about the kind of what, what surviving might mean in terms of best interest. That seems like a really interesting thing to get discussing. Okay, I'm going to hand over to the panel to see what they might have to say about this question. Maybe I can start with Mei Yo, just because you are our paediatric expert after all on the panel. Sorry, I'm arrowing you there, Mary. I hope you don't mind. So, so. Um, as I, as, as I said, I mean, good ethics requires good facts. Okay? So, and I think there are some facts here that uh, should be um, elaborated on or should be found out. Okay? So um, when we talked about... Uh, because when you, when you look at the face value, 35 weaker isn't really so, so premature. Um, and I think our neonatal, neonatal friends will say that, you know, this is, this is really nothing very much. Yes, there's a brain bleed and, and all that. Um, but in today's kind of technology world, this patient will survive. Okay, I, I don't think there's any issue about you know not surviving. But then survive to what? Um, then so so now is so is now it sounds like it's more like a quality of life kind of discussion already. So this neural disability, how bad is a neural disability? It can be just somebody who walks with a limb to somebody who is totally AD, ADL dependent, right? Um, so so we need to sort of find out as much as we can from the experts and uh, neurologists, uh, neurosurgeons and, 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 and all that. Um, what is the probability of the severity of neural disability? But again, you know, all this is, is all, you're only guessing, right? You, there's no way of knowing until it actually happens. Um, so, but we have to make a decision with the best available uh, knowledge that we have at this point in time. 
Um, and although we keep saying, oh, you know, money shouldn't come into all our ethical decisions, but like what you to say, uh, and, and you know what I have to say, in reality, it does, okay, especially for a foreigner who does not have access to subsidies, okay. Um, so, I don't have an answer, <laughs> but usually what we do when the case comes to the clinical ethics committee is we'll look at Usually we sort of look at the four box or you know the, the usual kind of analysis to see what are the peripheral um, issues that can impact on the decision. Um, and again, we don't make uh, uh, a recommendation in isolation. We make a recommendation with you know with everybody together, bringing in our, our point of views and, and and all that, and take seriously into account what the family's uh, fears are. Is it really just money? Okay, or is it something else? Okay, so uh, sometimes it may be that uh, uh, there is um, a lot of cultural kind of misunderstanding about disability, and that has to be, and that may be a knowledge thing, and that has to be addressed. I'm sorry, I don't have an actual answer for you. <laughs> no, that was very helpful. Thank you. Either of the other panelists like to comment, or yeah. Yep. Um, I would like to start off by clarifying um, the clinical context uh, for uh, delegates here that may not be familiar with the healthcare setting so well. Right? So we are talking about a case whereby we have a neonate that may survive uh, breathing on her own in a few days' time. So that's one issue. Right? If you were to remove the ventilator, uh, she might very well die. Right? Now, second question here is this, uh, that's a question of neuroprognostication, which means how much uh, neurological impairment will the child incur as a result of the bleed and uh, how much of it would be reversible, knowing uh, the reserve, the physiological reserve of a child uh, and be able to uh, recover. Right? And that, I think, is something that we will not be able to have an answer for over a short period of time. So um, Dr. Chan is very brave to have set up this vignette because I also don't know how to answer this in full, but I'll try my best. <laughs> uh. So the, the thing that's going through the clinician's mind now is this, right? So if I were to remove the mechanical ventilator, the child will die in my hands, right? And there's a chance that she might recover with a lot of support, right? But uh, at this moment, the, the, the family members, which is the, the parents, are the legal guardians. They are legally bestowed with the authority to make a decision of best interest for their baby. Who are we as uh, healthcare professionals to then contest that we can uh, purport what is the best interest over a, pair, over a pair of parents with no ill intent for the child, right? Um, the other thing is this, you know, uh, before we assume our own moral or religious yardstick and judge whether it is right or wrong, you know, it is often good to find out the context of their decision. And this vignette, uh, we find that uh, both parents come from humble background. They come from rural parts of China, right? So if let's say uh, they, they have a child with disability, it is unlikely that they can hold their job in Singapore. Right, they will have to go back to their hometown, you know, uh, or either that or, you know, they have to leave the child under the care of perhaps uh, family members back in China. And uh, you can then think about the quality of life of a child with disability staying far away from their parents, her, her parents, right? Uh, and not to mention the financial, emotional stress that the family needs to undergo. So before we judge that they are morally right or wrong, I think it's important that we appreciate the context within which they make uh, that decision. Right? And uh, I think it's also important to first ascertain that the parents clearly know uh, what they are into, which means that if they extubate now, the intention is for natural death, okay, without a chance for this child to exhibit potential recovery. Right? And uh, were they informed about what the potential neurological impairment in the future and that there might be a reversibility element here that we may see in a couple of months or years? Right? Are they fully informed in that decision? Uh, have they considered this decision in a mature and measured manner rather than as an impulsive and emotional one? Now, this makes a difference because if the parents have considered the situation very comprehensively, you know, uh, objectively, considering everything that we have mentioned so far, you know, then you can't really blame them and say that this is not a decision based on what they perceive to the best interest of this child and their family unit. Right? So that's something to also uh, think about. 
right? Now, I'm going to go more pragmatic here. So assuming this is uh, uh, a blue letter that comes to the uh, ethics committee, a blue letter is a referral, right? And um, the ethics committee have to deliberate what to do, you know? So honestly, what we will think, you know, within the ethics committee is that, okay, so, you know, if we want to go against the wishes of the parents, right, we will then have to go to the child protection unit, okay, and then argue on the basis that the parents are not acting in the best interest of the child. Right? And, and for the, the legal authorities to then override uh, the parental decision, uh, they have to be on pretty strong grounds. Right? And, and you have to prove rather convincingly that this is not in the child's best interest. So you have to then consider in your um, country's uh, medical legal climate and the agencies that you are working with, are they prepared to take up this case whereby the outcomes are going to be you know, iffy, iffy, you know, no one would know truly how this is going to happen. Right? And when you do that and you bring this case to, to court or to a legal authority, you are facing a full out war with the parents about relationship breaks. Okay, it will be all, all hell break loose in a neonatal ICU. <laughs> there will be uh, a lot of bad press, bad attention. Uh, although it shouldn't come into play in the ethical decision making process, but once this case goes to your, your senior management, they will consider it because it will hit the press. <laughs> uh, you'll be guaranteed that you'll be in some form of social media. Right. So after putting all this into consideration, is the organization willing to take this case up and say that truly this is in a child's best interest to maintain that ventilation and watch? And then who's going to pay for it? So I think that that would be how I look at the problem. Uh, personally, if you push me to a corner, I would say that you know, um, if the parents truly want to remove the mechanical ventilator and they have considered all the issues as we have described, it is not unfair for them to do so. And that's my personal views. Right? Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Sumi for the invitation. Uh, I came here to learn. I didn't expect to be in the hot seat. Um, yeah, so, so maybe uh, because of that, maybe I'll try to put it across uh, from a practitioner's perspective rather than as an ethicist because I'm not trained in that. Um, I'd like to look at this case uh, from the perspective of Fia Inka. Why, one is why did the patient's um, um, family, parents who want to ask for early extubation, knowing that there's a chance that uh, the, the, the baby can actually survive if we prolonged um, uh, that intubation period. Um, I think one of the main reasons cited here is because of financial uh, uh, reasons. And I think this is something that coming from the patient's perspective or the family's perspective can understand. But the question here is, can we do more to help them uh, make a, a more informed decision? For example, we know that no doubt there's no subsidy uh, in, in, for a foreigner to, to, um, who works in Singapore uh, for the healthcare system, but I think what we can do from the medical social point, uh, workers' point of view is to think about other options. And we have tried many a times for crowdfunding. I think this day and age, these are things that we can do, practical things we can do to help them. Maybe with that kind of an avenue of uh, additional support, they may think twice about uh, the request to, for an early extubation. The other thing is about neuroplasticity, as I was thinking. This is a one-day-old uh, baby, right? To say that uh, 10 years down the road, he or she will have a, a disability and that will affect the quality of life will be a judgment that's made too early. I think uh, it's not for us to make at this point in time. So I, I do feel that uh, with that in mind, I think uh, to make a judgment and say that uh, the quality of life will be affected, I think it will be too premature. The third thing I'm thinking of is really from the healthcare professional's point of view, uh, the moral distress that this can cause. Um, the team that's looking after this baby, uh, having to make a decision of an extubation and potential death, how does it impact on the healthcare team? Right? Because I think uh, moral distress is something very real. I think uh, Prof Lalit mentioned that as well, and something that we tend to forget. Right? Because uh, among us who, who practice medicine, I'm, I'm sure we all have our own religious belief and so on. So, the sanctity of life is something that some, some of us really hold dear to and, and if we don't take that into account and we ignore that, I think it has implication on the individual as well. So if you ask me, I think uh, coming from that angle, uh, I would probably say no as well at this point in time. I think we need to give uh, some time uh, at least to talk to the parents, bring in a social worker and look at all these aspects before uh, we make a decision. Great, thank you. So a lot of complexity, a lot of context being relevant, and the challenge of thinking about this holistically. Maya, do you want to add something else? Yeah, I was going to say that sometimes we, we, when we're uncertain, we give trial of treatment. 
But this one is a bit difficult. You kind of, like what Nita was saying, you might have lost the window where you can actually withdraw treatment and let the child die. But having said that, you, you're not really sure whether if you withdraw the ventilator that the child will die. Because another option, that, another scenario that can happen is the child survives and then suffers more insult to the brain and then you get even worse neurodisability. So, so, I mean, there are a lot of uncertainties and all these has to be conveyed to the, to the parents. Um, and, and on the other hand, like what I was saying, I mean, to, to us, the medical professionals, 35 weeks sounds like, you know, it's really nothing, you know, it's not a big deal. I mean, I'm sure a lot of the neonatologists will be up in arms if I say that, you know, this, this prognosis, you know, is, is like very poor and, and, you know, that kind of thing. But to the parents, again, it's a big thing, especially if this is a, a you know, a foreigner who don't have support system, don't have money, you know, don't have, uh, sometimes may not understand so much, you know, it's a foreign environment and, and all that. So we have to be very cognizant of, of the fact. Lah. And, and whatever the decision that's made, I think the, the, the thing to do is to sort of everybody should be on board. And even if part of the staff in the ICU uh, say, you know, yes, we should withdraw, or the other half of the staff say, no, we shouldn't withdraw, the worst thing that will happen is when you have polarization in the, you know, in the, in the, uh, uh, your, your ward or your ICU and all that. So whatever decision that's made, everybody should come about and say that, you know, either you agree to disagree and this is what the family wants or, you know, what we think that it's not good for the family or, or whatever, because it's, it's it can really descend to, you know, people f f saying that, uh, you know, how can you uh, withdraw from a 35-weeker? We have lots of 35-weekers who are walking around and, and all, yeah, a little bit of limp and all that, but it's okay, what, you know? So, so don't make value judgments on other people's uh, uh, values, basically. Thanks, Mayak. Yeah, the, the question of value judgments here seems to be really critical, doesn't it? And we can see the case from multiple angles, and we can take into account multiple elements of the context that could change our weighing up of different considerations. That's really helpful. Thank you. OK, we're going to move on to the second question now. So to give you a bit of context for this, the idea here is that you know, the medical team here think that treatment should be uh, continued, as we know. Many of you agreed with them on that, that we shouldn't withdraw ventilation. So a management plan is being considered by the people who want to continue the treatment. And the question then raised is this, is it ethically appropriate for the healthcare team to delay informing the parents by a few days so they can then withdraw the ventilator when they know the baby will survive without it? So a lot less uncertainty here, as I might expect, and also a clear response. It would not be ethically appropriate to delay informing the parents. Um, I might ask, I think, the panel to comment on this rather than going to the audience, just for time reasons. Would you concur with the audience that this is ethically problematic if we were going to do this? Maybe perhaps explain why that might be? Um, it would be deception, right? <laughs> and, and if the family were to find out, I mean, he's really going to... You are really going to break the trust of the family. I think we should always be honest, you know, with the, as much as, uh, as with whatever information that we have, as much as we can with the family. I, I would go further to say that legally we are required to be honest with the family. We are continuing with a, a invasive treatment, uh, and the consent is given by the legal guardian. They have every right to uh, know what is being done, and uh, be it under the uh, modified Montgomery test or under our SMC ECG, we are mandated to be honest with these parents. Great, thank you very much. I think that seems like a pretty clear position, and I think that manipulation through withholding information does look quite dubious, perhaps. We won't, we won't take it into consideration the arguments in favour just for the time. Um, I'm going to move us now to the final question that we've been posed for this case, because I think we probably answered the third one quite extensively already. But we have had some interesting discussion, both from the audience and from the panel, about this cultural and religious context of these kinds of decisions. So it seems right that many of the driving forces or motivations behind the parents' views, and of course potentially behind the health professionals' views, will lie in a set of cultural or religious beliefs. What weight should those beliefs play in decisions of these kinds, particularly if they seem to clash with other principles in play um, for decisions of this kind? So culture, 
religion, they're in play. We know that from, as described in the case, we know that this family comes from a particular cultural setting and certain cultural presuppositions might follow from that. Do we think that the cultural context or the religious beliefs of parents in this context matter for how we weigh up the best interests of children like this. Anybody like to volunteer? We have a volunteer already. Hi, uh, so my name is Jingyi, MSW here. Uh, I just uh, want to share a bit about my experience working with families who are Chinese nationals. Um, so from my understanding in China, right, um, relational autonomy is very, it's a very important concept. And a lot of these de healthcare decisions are family decisions. So they probably come from a context where they feel that they have a right to decide. They, they feel entitled to the parental right to decision. Um, so they, will come, they may come off very strongly that um, you are not acting according to my wishes. Um, so I think in this kind of scenario, we always have to educate them that they have to follow the law of the land. Uh, whereas, you know, in Singapore, we, uh, it's not just solely your decision. and We cannot do what is medically inappropriate. Um, so I think that part may help. Um, so I wrote down some other points. Uh, okay, I think the other part, um, I just wanted to address the point about crowd, crowdfunding, which uh, Dr. Wu has raised earlier on. Because a lot of times, I think sometimes we do not uh, actively suggest that they do crowdfunding, um, although they may actually think about it and they may want to explore it. But I think we also need to think about the ethics of crowdfunding. Um, because there are, there are a lot of journals written on it, you know, in terms of like privacy concerns, um, you know, the media exposure to the family. A lot of times they may not uh, anticipate some possible uh, issues that may arise. So I think we have to be quite cautious. Uh, but that being said, um, in my MSW head, I also think that there are other solutions we can offer them. So for example, I think we can educate them about the, you know, so for example, if they are S-pass holders, they are entitled to a dependent uh, pass. So maybe they could apply for one of the grandparents to come over to help facilitate the care of the child. In terms of long-term cost, um, I think sometimes we may not be able to help um, directly with foreigners. We can try and source for donated items to our own private fundraising, especially you know, in some of these cases, uh, the whole care team feels a lot for the family. And I think a lot of times we, we do have our own means to put together things for the family. So I think that's something for us to consider as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's a really helpful intervention. Anybody else like to add to those comments? It's this tension between, I guess, legal boundaries and cultural expectations seems really important in cases like this, particularly when people are traveling from other countries. Yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tak Seng. I'm actually, I'm a member of the AH and NUH uh, Clinical Ethics Committee, also the National Organ Transplant Ethics Committee. I think the two issues that why the parents have decided what they have decided are two things. One is the long-term care of a baby that probably will not be able to do activities of daily living. That's of concern. Second, of course, is the finance. And so I think, I think the issue with the culture and the religion part, as far as I'm concerned, is that I think if we respect the sanctity of life, and then every child born should have the opportunity to live a full life. But unfortunately, I think in this case, the parents did not expect and does not expect to have a child with a neural deficit because of the brain hemorrhage. Nobody wants that. And so because of the two considerations, the easy way out in a way is to terminate and so let the baby die. But if we then respect the sanctity of life, then what we should do, we should, we should explore all the options. And I agree with the panel, I think the, the two things is that we don't know how bad the neural deficit is. But we need to make sure the baby continues to live. But then in which case you cannot take off the ventilator. The second issue is then, the resources available for long-term care. In the event that they can't stay in Singapore and go back, for example, to China, then we need to look at the resources available, psychosocial as well as healthcare available in those areas. Presumably, I think the baby can only go back if the ventilator, if the baby is ventilator independent, I assume. 
If not, then probably have to stay here for a longer period of time. With help and support, from charity, crowdfunding included. But this needs to be explained, you know. Somebody has to explain to the father and the mother regarding the options available and the consequences. In other words, what we have to tell them is that we hope for the best, but we must prepare for the worst. What they have done is that they have taken the worst possible scenario and say, yeah, turn on the ventilator, end of story. So, so to me, the cultural and religious beliefs are no different to sustaining life. The issue now is what do we do? For a baby, in fact, there are two variations in your case study. The first variation says uh, if the patient cannot do all of the activities of daily living, what would be your response? The second one says if you can do some of the activities of daily living in terms of moderate uh, damage, then what would you do? To me, both are still the same. The first one is worse off than the second one, of course. But it still requires care. So this care burden needs to be explained. The care burden needs to be quantified. The care burden needs to be articulated and hopefully a resource solution can come, both from the society, from family members, and from friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to the next case, perhaps I could just allow the panel to offer some final remarks on this question, if you have any. We've heard a range of different views and different ways of thinking about cultural values yeah. or, or the Maybe uh, uh, when Taksing was sharing this, uh, what came to mind was a documentary that I watched uh, some, some years back. Uh, it happened in China. Uh, so um, at one point, China has this one-child policy, right? So, so when children are born with disabilities, sometimes they're being abandoned. And there was this charity organization that took these kids uh, with disability and looked after them. And this documentary actually showed how good a life they could lead uh, with support from, from the charity. Uh, that brings to mind this thing about uh, what is quality of life here, le? right? Yeah, so I think uh, for the parents, it's unthinkable to have a child with disability, but uh, depending on really the culture, the, the setup and so on. So I think uh, to, to brush the side and say this is not important, I, I suppose uh, maybe too presumptive, but I think uh, we, we need to look at everything in, uh, in context. Uh, so there are options available, even in China. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody, for those comments. We'll move on to the second case now, just to keep broadly to time. Um, this is, a, as I said, a case at the other end of the age spectrum. Uh, sorry, can I just ask for the collective wisdom about the last case? I'm sorry, a bit slow, so please don't come to the mic. That's okay. The, I don't have answers to the questions. Actually, I put unsure for both the first and second question that you ask. My question then is that one is... If a patient is born in Singapore, which is a newborn, he has his own legal right, it's a separate entity, that's number one. Number two is born in Singapore. In some country, that means that you have a citizenship right. So that I'm something not sure. So this question actually I'll ask the MSW, who are very knowledgeable in resources and all that. Because if this is a Singaporean citizen, then the financial constraint will be reduced. So a lot of facts are unknown. So that's question one. The other question then is that if the statements by the medical field say that this patient can survive, correct? And we pull the plug of the intubation. My question is to all and to the panel, is this withdrawal treatment, which some say is oxymoron, Compared to euthanasia, what is the difference? Intention, the outcome is there. Or potentially death or worse disability or patients survive like the patient survived in Fulma, we don't know, it's unknown. Then going backwards, action, both us withdrawal. Correct? Intent, you argue that palliative is a oh, sorry, not a palliative, sorry. My boss is up there. <laughs> withdrawal, uh, withdrawal treatment is different from euthanasia because we do suffering. And euthanasia had idea to cure, but actually euthanasia in the end also reduce suffering. That's my 
you really drew, drew, drew to the point, both is the same. So what case, what is the difference between this case between withdrawal versus euthanasia? In this case, it will be active euthanasia. Because you an act, it's an active act to withdraw to withdrawal. Then are we committing murder? Because if you agree with all my steps, that means you're actually murdering the patient. You see, that's my thinking. Then about disability, that's why I don't know about this guy, probably ask my ethics or ask my chair. So I, that's why I'm not sure about this neural disability, what it means. You see, it's really a suffering. And suffer so much that I need to be palliative or need to put to death. If that's the case, why are we having all the handicaps, handicaps homes in Singapore? So by extension, even though children in the handicap homes are all suffering, if that's the case, all shouldn't them go through a simple process. I do not have answers. This is just some of my thoughts. I'm looking forward to a collective wisdom. Thank you. Three very good, very weighty questions to finish with. Any remarks, briefly, if you could? With regards to this question about euthanasia and withdrawal of um, life support, I think it's important to make a distinction between an omission of an intervention uh, and the active application of an intervention that kills. Right? So in both scenarios, um, there may be an advanced illness in the background. Okay? But in the case of a withdrawal, there is already a pathology that can imminently cause death to occur. What you do is that you're omitting an intervention that continues life. What kills the patient in the end is the underlying illness and not the act of withdrawal. In fact, it is not considered an act on ethical legal analysis. It is an omission of a treatment that you feel is not beneficial or it's unwanted. Now, I agree that this is difficult to apply fully in this case that uh, Dr. Chan has put up, right? because we are dealing in a case right, whereby um, the underlying illness, which is the intracranial bleed, uh, may potentially change such that the patient may be able to breathe on her own spontaneously in a couple of days' time. We don't know. Right? She may be able to, she may not be able to. Right? That is the difficulty that we are facing now. But uh, in this particular situation, um, of course, everything should be done to help the family member understand that these are the resources available that we can support you. We try to help you uh, with this regard as much as possible. But if the parents refuse and say that no matter what, I do not want to continue, for example, let's say despite best efforts with every persuasion possible, they said no, right? Then in this case, the physician uh, is actually forced to a corner and said that um, the parents being the uh, legal guardian has made a decision, okay? Under the law, I have to comply unless I contest that they are not befitting of a legal guardian and they are not acting in the best interest of the patient. In this situation, we are omitting a treatment because the legal guardian feel that this is not in the best interest of their child. So unless you are willing to contest that stand, okay, then we can talk about um, you know, continuing treatment, going ahead with all aggressive measures. So that's one point I want to make. The second point is this, okay, it's definitely good and wholesome to try to help gather resources to help with this particular case. It is a tragedy that no one wants to go through, I mean, no matter whose family, right? But a second case may come in the future, a third case may arise in the future, and are we going to mobilize the same amount of uh, resources to help another child in the same situation? Because by creating a precedent, you are saying that this is potentially a new standard that we are looking at. Are we going to go to that extent? Right? Of course, it would be good if we can, but if we can't, you know, it is not wrong. It is not wrong. Right? So I'm, I'm just trying to distinguish here this fine line between you know, obligation. Right? It is good to do, but we may not be obliged to do it in the setting that we function in. Okay, it is not a particular pleasant way to end off this vignette, right? but uh, this is the reality of life as it is. We are restricted by resources. We are restricted by time urgency to make a decision. We are restricted by how much, um, how much energy and power you want to really contest, contest this parent's decision. Right? Yeah. Thank you. And any comments on this first point about 
than nationality mattering, because in the sense of thinking about how that should weigh in in the best interest of the child, it looks like we could come to very divergent judgments because we know that the cost implications and the context are going to be so different in the future. How do we address that potential injustice? I mean, it's true. I mean, in the perfect world, all this shouldn't matter. Money shouldn't matter, race shouldn't matter. Anybody who comes through the door, you should treat everybody the same. But this is not real life, right? I mean, you know, and, and when we get young doctors who are very upset and say, this is very unfair. You know, why, why, you know, just because of the fact that the parents are Chinese, uh, from China and all that, why are you treating your child different? But remember, life is not fair. You know, if this child had been born in China, in the rural area, it probably wouldn't, wouldn't even go through the doors of hospital, probably would have died, you know, uh, uh, and all that. So, so what, what's the fairness of that? I mean, the, the, we are talking about doing the best you can uh, with whatever resources you have. And when you're talking about, you know, disability, you know, are we saying that, you know, does that mean that any neural disability means that it's not a wife, life worth living and all those kids in the handicapped home should be allowed to die and all that? This is a judgment value, right? Uh, sorry, this is a value judgment, right? We're not talking about, when you're talking about suffering, you're not talking about physical suffering, which we can do something about. And this is what, you know, healthcare professionals often tend to um, mix up. You know, when you talk about suffering, what, what, what do you mean by suffering? Okay, you're talking about physical pain, you know, vomiting and all that, and healthcare professionals can do something about. If you're talking about suffering as, is this good quality of life? Is a child happy, you know? Uh, is, is, the, is this life worth living? This is, this is not in the realm of uh, sort of medical, physical kind of symptoms. It is a value judgment. And to these parents and their values and their religion and the way they are brought up, to them, if they understand the facts correctly, lah, huh, this is not to them. This is not a life worth living for them, for their child. It may not be your values. Your values might be that I think no matter how disabled the child is, whether the child can understand, uh, recognize me or not, all life is you know, the sanctity of life. We talk about you know, the sanctity of life. People always throw around this you know, sanctity of life. But what is the definition of life? Is life just a mere biological existence or is life something that has goals, something that uh, you, know, you can appreciate, something that uh, means that you have relationships and all that? So it is a value judgment. And that's why you have to uh, be clear in your mind what is the conflict between you and the parents? Is it a value judgment? In which case, you know, you can't change all your years of upbringing, neither can they change all their years of upbringing and, and beliefs. You just have to find common ground. Thank you, Mayo. That's great. We'll move on now to the second case. We have time to discuss that. So here, we have a different kind of patient in a very different scenario. Madam Sim, a 78-year-old Chinese lady who suffers from end-stage kidney disease, necessitating hemodialysis three times a week, at a community dialysis centre. She's widowed and has a close relationship with her two children, Edwin and Alina. She's currently admitted to the hospital for abdominal pain and was diagnosed to have pancreatic cancer, which has metastasized to the liver and lung. At her advanced stage of illness, she is not a candidate for surgery. She is not keen for chemotherapy for fear of side effects. Her oncologist has provided an estimated prognosis of less than three months. She continues to receive three times a week hemodialysis while warded in the hospital. However, owing to recurrent infections and her other chronic medical issues, her blood pressure would fall below the safety limit towards her last hour of dialysis, leading to premature termination. Her renal physician forewarns that dialysis will become increasingly challenging as her disease progresses. Hypertension during dialysis can lead to myocardial infarctions and strokes associated with morbidity and mortality. On the other hand, terminating dialysis will lead to her dying within two weeks. Several family meetings were conducted by Madame Sim's physician to explain the gravity of the situation. Edwin and Alina were distraught by their mother's diagnosis of stage four cancer. They're praying for a miracle and ask for everything to be done to sustain Madame Sim's life, including dialysis and ICU care, should it be necessary. Madame Sim herself, who remains alert and coherent, is also keen for life prolongation. Given that Madame Sim's condition is expected to deteriorate steeply, should dialysis be, con be, sorry, be discontinued, 
on the basis of medical futility. So, yes, it should be discontinued. No, it shouldn't be discontinued or unsure. Again, we have some disagreement, but there seems to be a, a favoured position emerging. And that seems to be, two-thirds of you almost, thinking that, no, we should continue dialysis. So the answer is no, we sh it should not be discontinued. And therefore, we should continue, presumably. So, once again, a kind volunteer to come up and explain the majority position. Why should we continue dialysis in someone in Madame Sim's condition thinking about her best interests? Why is dialysis's continuation the right course of action? Ronnie well, from uh, University of Malaya. I work mostly in ICU. Just talking about, uh, in this case, just thinking about the medical fertility, this patient has got a, a pancreatic CA, and then on top of end stage renal failure, which necessitates the dialysis. It's not so clear whether uh, the dialysis is. Uh, cannot be continued because of it's a patient in having low blood pressure, but there is always options of more gentle dialysis uh, that we can offer to this patient. Maybe this patient cannot undergo the reg regular hemodialysis, but there's always another option of maybe CRRT, continuous renal, renal um, uh, hemodialysis that we can offer to this patient. So I don't think it's appropriate to just completely stop uh, the dialysis just on the basis that we can't offer the normal dialysis. That's, that's just okay. my thought. Maybe if the patient does not undergo di dialysis, will die because of not doing dialysis or because of uremia, because of complications of not undergoing dialysis rather than because of the pancreatic uh, CA. Just, just my thoughts. OK, great. Thank you. So one reason for saying no here might be because there are other alternatives that could be viable and could, be, could, could lead to a different kind of an outcome in terms of the two-week deterioration, I guess. I just realised that if you answered no here, you might have two, two conclusions to draw. One is that you should continue dialysis. The other is that it should be discontinued, but not on the basis of medical futility, of course. Um, anybody else who took the no view about why they wanted to, to conclude? Yes, please. Okay. So there are a few issues here. Uh, I'm King Tai from Mount Alvernia Hospital. So this patient and her children are united in a very strong will to live. They've not been able to accept the fact that death is probably imminent. Uh, she is still able to be dialyzed, and there are, there are different options for dialysis, such as very gentle dialysis without making the blood pressure drop too low. And um, it appears that she's not ready to die, certainly from the cancer, and most likely not even from the kidney disease. So from that perspective, um, I think that we should continue if the family is able to afford it. I'm privileged because I practice in the private sector, and in our situation, it's quite clear. If the patient understands clearly and they are willing to pay for it, there's usually no conflict at all. And sometimes this is a way of buying time for both the patient and the family to be able to come to terms with the diagnosis, and things may change after a few weeks or months. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that argument about the will to live being common to both family and patient looks, looks important, doesn't it? And I like that idea at the end there, that you know, one argument for continuation is to allow the family to come to terms with what's happening. Good, thank you. On the other side of the fence, those of you who think, yes, we should discontinue on the basis of futility. Would anybody like to volunteer their, their view? Yes, thank you. Actually, I'm about to return to my seat. <laughs> 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 
just to be honest for that. Um, I came a bit late. Uh, so actually, I just wanted to explore further uh, the, two the two children and Madam Sims stand about to continue dialysis, whether the decision is uh, expressed uh, on the ground that they are not sure what will happen, will it be a very tragic and suffering process when the dialysis is discontinued? Whether it's because of that, they strongly express that, please continue the dialysis. Uh, I just wonder if we're able to offer another option that fertility always discuss together that how we can support you after a treatment being withdrawn. So if withdrawal of treatment and what other supportive measures, these two are always discussed together, whether the family and madam seem able to feel more supported and uh, will have different uh, decision at the end. Thank so you. actually my stand is I will still continue the dialysis, perhaps uh, with a gentle form of sustained uh, sled so that we have more time to have conversation and know the family better. Thank you. So regardless of the answer to this question, we might be thinking about what should be done next to enable the proper support to be provided in the end of life period, whether it's shorter or longer. That seems like an important point. Anybody else want to come up and comment on the reasons in favour of discontinuation at this point? on the basis of futility? Because we have 33% of you who told that view. Uh, hi, I'm Willin from uh, National Cancer Institute, Malaysia. Um, I guess I have a few thoughts on uh, this. Um, probably the yes and no, um, it's, it's not so clear. Probably in the sense that at this point in time, it, there is a bit a leaning towards the should continue dialysis. But I feel there's a few points to explore in, um, in that would be what is the patient's own experience and her thoughts on the experience of her dialysis as now she's already experiencing hypotension during dialysis. That can potentially be quite symptomatic for her and how does she feel um, during the experience and does that change her uh, views on continuing dialysis or not. Um, family, um, what are their thoughts and their fears about um, withdrawing in, in terms of are they afraid that she might be um, their fear of losing her mother uh, their mother, or is there some other fears and more exploration on psychosocial concerns that needs to be addressed? Um, there's also, if we put, tease the case apart from renal perspective, um, if the patient is starting to experience hypotension during dialysis, we do have to explore other options of dialysis, but in her situation, probably peritoneal dialysis is not a, a, an option at all. Um, but it is also opening up that trajectory of thinking that dialysis will eventually be a problem and therefore it has to be withdrawn. So um, putting that together on top of that, having an advanced pancreatic cancer does make the whole conversation uh, much more leaning towards we do have to start approaching that conversation seriously. Um, so I think there's a lot of points to really go in depth to um, while we are uh, managing this patient. Um, yeah, I think that's my thoughts. Um, Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'd like to pass over to my panel members now to comment on this question, but also some of the things they've heard from the audience and, and your views about, about those arguments for and against. Who'd like to start? Yeah, I'll start off with because I created this big net, right? Uh, <laughs> and it's an amalgamation of uh, several patients that we have been seeing uh, in recent months. And it's not an uncommon thing within the hospital system, right? Dialysis is uh, quite a frequently seen procedure, you know, and um, patients do die of cancer. Uh, one in three of them in Singapore anyway, right? Uh, the first point I want to make here is that perhaps when dialysis was first uh, formulated and created. It's probably the, the second miracle uh, within the medical fraternity compared to the mechanical ventilator. In fact, I can't recall which came first. 
right? But uh, the, the truth of the matter is that dialysis has become so routine that all of us have taken dialysis for granted when it's truly a life-sustaining treatment that comes with its own risk, its own burden and its complications, right? Um, the second point I want to make here is that this is a newly diagnosed um, advanced cancer. Pancreatic cancer is notorious uh, in terms of its short prognosis and even if you undergo chemotherapy, the outcome generally is still rather poor in the first six months to a year. Many people still die despite chemotherapy with a relapse, right? Uh, and in this situation, uh, you can see that I pieced this story together such that the patient is very confused, right? She dare not take on chemotherapy for fear that she will suffer more physical symptoms, and yet she wants to live on, especially when dialysis is already part of her life, and she doesn't think too much about it in the first place. It's like, it's, it's, it doesn't give her much pain, she has been on it for years, uh, but it's a discontinuation of which uh, will lead to almost death, certain death within two weeks' time. Right? Uh, so she's in a confused state. So is the family members who is newly told of this very poor outcome. The whole family is in a state of confusion. You can even classify them as having an existential distress because their, their whole life has been disrupted, their personhood has been fractured, and they don't know how to continue. They're ex basically expressing confusion and a lot of distress or hoping to return to normalcy, right? So it is then the, the duty of the clinician to try to clarify the situation, right? So from a medical standpoint, we have to explain the trajectory to the patient that, you know, at this point with the recurrent sepsis, um, you may never see the light of chemotherapy even though this might be your best chance, right? Uh, secondly, you know, uh, while we can do gentle dialysis or SLAT in the hospital setting, this would mean she may never be able to leave the hospital, right? Unless she's well enough to undergo the usual four-hour dialysis in the community dialysis center, she will be hospitalized. She will never be able to go home, right? Um, so which means she may never leave the hospital. Thirdly, you know, as her, uh, her pancreatic cancer progresses amidst the other acute illnesses, her function will drop, she'll suffer from more illnesses, uh, and making dialysis more and more uh, not worthwhile, right? Because she may turn more confused, she may suffer from malcardial infarction, she may suffer from more burden as a result of both treatment and the illness itself, and the benefit of dialysis may become slimmer and slimmer over time. So actually, we do know from a clinician's standpoint that she would, in, in our words, self-declare herself in a couple of weeks' time, because by then, it is quite clear to everyone, be it herself, her family member, or her physician, that dialysis would need to stop. Right? Not only because of its risk, but because the patient may become confused from liver failure and from infection, such that she may not be able to appreciate the benefit that dialysis has brought her uh, in the previous years of her life. Right? Uh, of course, um, we have to think about it from two perspectives, an ethical, legal perspective, and as a clinician. So uh, first and foremost, I am a palliative care physician before I am the ethicist. Ethics decision-making is subsumed under clinical decision-making. Right? So although we can say that, yes, you know, it is futile, we can say it's futile to continue because she's going to die anyway. Within a few short weeks, she'll self-declare that she can't dialyze. Right? But um, by not dialyzing her, Okay, we are basically not giving her the runway to process her emotions and therefore you know, it will push her existential crisis even one notch higher in terms of intensity. It makes it so much more difficult for us to help process her grief, her loss and that of her families as well. So I do agree when King Tai mentioned that sometimes we may need to buy the family some time within uh, feasible limits so that we can then get in a social worker, a psychiatrist, you know, a pastoral care provider to help them process this immediate period of grief and loss. Right? Knowing that along the way, the disease itself or its concomitant complications is going to declare to the family that there is no way we can continue, but we need to buy them that time. I'll end off my part by saying that actually, you know, in palliative medicine, we all know that death is not the problem. We all die. There's no solution to death, and therefore death is not a problem by definition because there's no solution. But coping with dying is the problem, right? And therefore, if we assume that suffering is the issue that we are addressing by providing dialysis in the interim just to buy some time for them to process their intention is to alleviate suffering, and therefore we can go on to buy them a bit more time. Yeah, thanks. Um, I agree totally with what Hani has said. Um, maybe just to add to that, um, a lot of times when we were asked to see a patient's <coughs> family to talk about um, termination of dialysis and so on, 
we always go in with the, with the agenda that uh, I need to convince them that we should stop the dialysis and so on, right? Um, I'm just wondering whether in this case, sometimes putting ourselves in their shoes, uh, we probably will go through the same kind of emotional you know, roller coaster and going in such that the family feel that you're on their side. So the, it shouldn't be why we should stop dialysis, but rather what if, what if along the way dialysis is no longer possible? What are the choices? What are the options? I think the family feel that you're on their side and you're not on the other side of the fence and trying to justify why they do not need, they should stop dialysis. I think uh, the conversation will be easier uh, along the way. Uh, just my personal take on that. Yeah. We also need to explore what the patient's goals are. Sometimes people say, oh, I want to prolong my life, but then they don't know actually what that life entails. Like, for example, like what Hani was saying, you know, if the, the pancreatic cancer will get worse, you get distended, it might get jaundice, it's going to get itchy, uh, itchiness because of the jaundice and all that. And, and the, the uh, dialysis might, might make the um, uh, hypertension even worse, and then, or, you know, don't go home and all that. So, so sometimes um, people might say something uh, without knowing the implication of what they they say. So, so I mean, I always go back to that. I mean, good ethics really require good facts. And so the patients really need to know, you need to find out uh, what the patient really means and is that really what they want. And sometimes I, I guess after you've discussed and all that and they realise that, hey, you know, by continuing and all that, I might actually have a worse off life. You know, instead, if I, had, if I were to stop and go home, I might spend a very good two weeks with my family. You know, so with that, you know, you, 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 you might kind of uh, stave off, you know, conflict line and, and all that, especially like, like uh, we all say, they, they feel that you are actually trying to bum my parents off because, you know, they are going to die and, and, and all that. But of course, you also have to realise that we, again, work under constraints. What if, while you are trying to talk and all that, you have a patient at the, at the, uh, you know, at the door that is uh, in a younger patient with a curable condition that requires your your ICU bed and requires your, your dialysis machine, then it's, it's also going to be an issue and you really have to tread things you know, carefully. Thanks very much. Now, just to finish this section of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the event, we'll turn to the second question, which I think hinges on the authority to decide and, and who has that authority to make decisions of these kinds. We'll have a shorter discussion about this particular question, but I think it's worth covering before we finish. So we're imagining, as predicted, that Madame Sim is going to deteriorate clinically. The question raised now is, should the medical team send her to ICU for extraordinary life-sustaining treatment because the family members are insisting on it? Okay. So this is the question. Family members insisting on treatment, should the medical team follow their insistence and, 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 and Madame Sim goes to the ICU? Yes, no, unsure. 67% saying no, we should not follow the insistence of the family members. 23 saying yes, we should do what the family members are requesting. Um, again, I think I'll just pass over to the panel, if I may, for this one, because we are running short of time. What's your view, and how would you manage that request? This is a, uh, a giveaway. We did mention this during our presentations earlier on. Uh, legally in Singapore, uh, the person that decides whether the patient should receive extraordinary life-sustaining treatment, especially, is actually the primary physician. Right? So in this case, we are not ethically or legally obliged to bring the patient to ICU on the unilateral demands of family members. Right? But having said so, the vast majority of the time, these issues can be resolved through good communication, offering a second opinion, be it an opinion from a medical oncologist, an opinion from an ICU consultant, blah, blah, right? to help them understand that uh, we are not trying to shortchange the family member, but the true fact is that the burden of treatment and its complication outweighs the potential good, right? So usually that will resolve the issue. But there are always that few, one or two minority every year, whereby the patient just crash at the ED, uh, next day ends up in the ward, and the family has no time to digest any news about the cancer. And that's when we may, on compassionate ground, bring the patient into the ICU just to allow one or two days for the family member to absorb in that information. But that should be a minority rather than majority. So there should be an element of compassion weighed in, but not for all cases. 
points? Can, can I just say, I think there was a comment earlier on about one of our MSW colleagues about uh, relational autonomy. And I think that's a, a bit of a misunderstanding. Relational autonomy does not imply that other your relations can make decisions for you. Relational autonomy really is about recognising that we are all, we don't exist in a vacuum. The individual does not exist in a vacuum. And whatever autonomous decision we make is made on the basis of our ties with our family, our ties with the community, our ties with church, if you go to church, uh, and, and, and all that. So it does not imply that other people uh, make decisions for you. So in this case, relational autonomy, autonomy like what uh, Han Yu was suggesting, what, that you, you understand that the family has, um, has a, a kind of a stake in, in that person. And so by being compassionate and, and all that, we know that whatever decisions, whatever decisions they make is, is not in a vacuum. I mean, you know, the, the lady doesn't exist with, not on its own, you know. So um, it doesn't mean that we let the family make decisions, but it means that we take into account that there are all these, you know, ties that, that bind us together. Great, thank you very much. Now, I'm aware of the time. I don't want to keep people from their lunch for much too long. We have about three minutes left on the clock. So um, I'm going to move on to conclude. Um, the centre team very kindly prepared some slides for me, which I need to now find. Key takeaways for the session. Um, so I'll just review some of the points that have been made and some of the, the, the I guess, the wider literature on these kinds of decisions. Um, this slide refers to the first case. It's the newborn baby case. And I think we're going to hear from Dominic Wilkinson later, aren't we? Yes, after the, after the break. So his view, and, and there are other ethicists who hold this view, is that you know, the, the best way of understanding a decision of this kind is to consider the future well-being of the child in question. It's to ask, and this is his terminology, whether this child will have a life worth living or whether they won't. And what he asked us to consider, as others do as well, not just him, is that of the benefits versus the burdens. And he asked us to consider whether the future benefits that could accrue to this child's life will outweigh those burdens. There's another argument that there might be a zero point where the benefits are entirely equal to the burdens and we have to decide what to do in a situation like that. Now, these concepts of whether the child will have a life worth living or a life not worth living, or even the idea of a zero point, are controversial and contested. One reason they're controversial is because they ride roughshod over any other ethical consideration. It's simply a matter of determining on the facts available the future welfare of that child. And that is a benefit burden calculation. That's not uncontroversial. And certainly it won't align with certain cultural or religious commitments that people might have when they are coming to deciding on these matters. But even internal to the discussion, of balancing benefits and burdens, we have to be able to predict an almost infinitesimally large number of possible permutations about things that could happen in the future that would determine beneficial or burdensome outcomes for that child. So the requirement really is to get as, the, as much evidence as you can about what is likely to happen given the circumstances. We can't know, for example, whether the parents will divorce or abandon the child or whether China will invade Taiwan or whether we'll find a cure for the brain injury that underpins the problem in 10 years' time. Those things matter for this argument. But of course, they're unknowable. We're in the world of the what-ifs. So we have to, I think, if we take this view seriously, work with the facts that we can know and make a judgment about whether the life indeed will be won that is worth living. And the really hard thing here is to do that without just endorsing certain biases we might have about the kinds of lives people could lead in different settings, with different disabilities, etc. And that's why the multiple perspectives on what the benefits and burdens might consist in from all participants in this kind of case, I think, are critical. The law, as it says on the slides, isn't going to settle or help us much here. It's just going to point us towards thinking about welfare in the broader sense. Okay, 
the second uh, case. So we didn't discuss this at length, but there was a certain assumption in the case that Madam Sim certainly has a view that she's expressing, and it's one of life prolongation. And that's aligned with what the family think. Whether she has the capacity to make that decision is a little bit unclear, I think, at the time we're talking about, but certainly it's in the background. We know from the helpful presentations earlier that treatment cannot be requested if it's not clinically indicated and non-beneficial. And that treatment might also be harmful and therefore definitely not indicated. So that's a critical question, I guess. What's clinically indicated? What's beneficial? Is it going to be harmful to continue? There's also the justice argument. If the bed is in short supply, we have somebody else who could better use, get, get greater benefits from it, that will be depriving somebody of acquiring that benefit, depending on the circumstances, of course. And we should be helping Ms. Madame Sim and her family to understand how the benefits and burdens, the harms that might be involved in these decisions could present themselves. And as other people in the audience said earlier, what we can do to mitigate those harms or maximize the benefits, given the reality, as we discussed, about the life, uh, the length of time that, that Madame Sim is going to survive. Some final other legal points to make. The family members are not the decision makers, as everybody, I think, mostly agreed, and that was certainly the point that was made on, on the panel, even if they have an LPA, because that can't cover life-sustaining treatment decisions. Of course, the family are caught up in this decision, and their position and their role is critical, both for their own well-being, but also, I think, for their future care and the life and quality of life that Madame Sim will have. They may be concerned that not all is being done for her, so counselling them, supporting them, looks like it's ethically required in this kind of scenario. I don't think that's a, a particularly controversial conclusion to draw. Simply because the family have asked for Madame Sim, or perhaps demanded, insisted on it, is not itself a good reason to move her. But of course, there may be other reasons in some situations that will still apply. Oh, sorry, you want to finish with one, one final remark to our panellists? I, I cannot help myself. I must uh, just add on a comment here. Uh, if we don't mind going back uh, just to two slides ago, uh, whereby we talk about the, the ICU and the resource allocation part of things. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought this is an important point that I wanted to indicate you know, amongst Which the panel. Um, Yes, that's right. Yeah. So um, usually when uh, clinicians talk to family members with regards to um, whether the patient is suitable for ICU, we tend to argue on the principle of beneficence, right? In this case, right, we would rather say that Madam Sim's overall condition uh, would not benefit from ICU care. And therefore, we should not offer her, her an ICU bed because there'll be more harm done than good, right? Uh, by bringing up this issue about justice, uh, uh, emotively, the family member would be thinking that, hey, you know, you're not giving me the bed because someone else is waiting for ED, my loved one's life is less worthy than another person in ED. So we, 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 uh, we, we avoid that at all costs. Right? And in principle, these are two different things. The, the concept of rationing versus the concept of futility. It's good to make a demarcation between the two. Right, just to make a note of that. Thanks. Thanks very much. So we'll just thank our three panelists with a short gift. Thank you very much.